uh, let me start by saying something uh, positive. Uh, you know the pandemic is near the end, if not already over, when friends and family, I, I speak for myself, are, are visiting from afar. And today we have a new friend from very far away and a distinguished speaker, in my opinion, who comes from the beautiful city state of Singapore. And I had the fortune of being there. If you haven't, do visit. And he's gonna tell us more, but it is a country the size of Toronto. I looked it up, a little bit bigger than Toronto. And it has two great universities and they do some incredible research. And, and Professor Andrew Wee is our speaker today. He is a member of the physics department there. And let me first give you a little bit of his background and then also his expertise and interests, and then he'll do the rest. I promise to keep it short because I just know I can go through the pages and pages of interesting things he's done and the medals he has. But let me just say that for start, he got his bachelor's degree at Cambridge, UK, and his doctor at Oxford in the UK. And he was a Rhodes Scholar. He also has a PGCE, which is a Postgraduate Certificate in Education and Teaching at the University of London's Institute of Education for those who are on our teaching staff here. And he's a, a winner of many awards. Let me just name a few or a few fellowships he had that are distinguished. He's a fellow of the Singapore National Academy. He's a fellow of the Institute of Physics in Singapore. He's also a fellow of the Institute, Institute of Physics of the UK, as well as an academician of the APAM, which is the Asian Pacific Academy of Materials. Okay, so uh, some of the distinguishing things about his expertise are, he is an expert and established expert in the field of nanoscience. That's a broad topic, but he made some of the original contributions to surface physics using a range of very powerful techniques in fact, he's the author of a book some of you may have seen, published in 2009, called Science of the Nano, at the Nanoscale. Okay. So he is an expert in the sense of surface physics and interface physics on a range of novel materials and even conventional materials that show novel phenomena. Now, his <laughs> techniques of expertise are uh, scanning tunneling microscopy and spectroscopy. Uh, a technique you'll tell us a lot about, as well as using various synchrotron radiation probes to look at these materials and phenomena, interfaces and so forth. His current interests are in ferromagnetic two-dimensional materials, which are, again, things that happen at interfaces and surfaces, as well as two-dimensional molecular networks that are grown on surfaces, fabricated on surfaces. And he uh, has also recently uh, gone into, uh, done research on graphene-based quantum resistance devices, okay? So this, if this is not interesting in terms of new physics and new applications, I don't know what it is. And let me see, he also, it, so his techniques, uh, expertise also includes fabrication. This very, very powerful tool, molecular beam epitaxy, he has in his lab, and he's the group leader of a pretty big lab. And he does, basically, in my opinion, both tabletop physics, and also suitcase physics, meaning there's you know big uh, facilities where he takes his people in his group, the data, and in his lab, he also has a whole team of uh, experts and equipment where he's doing interesting research. So um, without mentioning anything else, if I've missed anything, Andrew, please forgive me. That, that's fine. And you could fill in. And, um, but I just want to sort of offer you a very warm welcome to Toronto. For various positive reasons, this today's colloquium is you know virtual or it's hybrid. For me, it's kind of like watching you know, football in a in a in a pub. But this is great; everything's working out. And Professor Wee, the positive thing, or the the good news is that Professor Wee actually has landed in Toronto, and he will be here uh, you know next month even. So for those of you who are interested in meeting him, we will definitely see him again here. You know, uh, maybe just being here, or maybe giving another seminar or something. And we'll have this. To, to try to convince him to come back in person. Okay, I think, I think he will. Anyway, so without further ado, let's welcome Professor Andrew Lee. Thank you very much, John, for your kind introduction. I'm so really sorry I can't be with you all in person. I really wanted to, but uh, my wife has COVID and it was, I was advised against coming in. And um, I think we've had to a lot of online seminars now and some of us are getting tired of online seminars. 
because uh, it, it's it's really difficult for the speaker to get feedback from the audience. But I hope, nevertheless, you would be able to give your feedback at the end of this seminar. Um, as John mentioned, I hope to be able to visit University of Toronto next month and meet some of you and uh, perhaps discuss a little more. Um, as he mentioned, I'm from the uh, Department of Physics, National University of Singapore. And um, in this physics colloquium, I'm supposed to give a general talk. So I shall give a general introduction to 2D materials and talk a bit about my research at, at the general level. And um, I think to begin with, since uh, many of you have not been to Singapore, I thought I'll start by showing a, a slide of Singapore. So that's a picture of Singapore. It's, uh, it's almost directly opposite Toronto. So it's about as far as you can go. And it took a long time for me to come here. <laughs> Unfortunately, I kind of lost one of my baggage as well. Um, it's it's uh, time zone is GMT plus eight. Um, and Toronto is GMT minus four, so it's exactly 12 hours behind. It's at the equator, one degree north. And so you can expect the temperature to be summer all year round. So average day temperature is, is certainly over 30 degrees, so it's quite hot. And um, lots more facts and figures about Singapore. Um, the land area is, is only about 600 plus square kilometers. You can see, you can even see the airport in this, in this diagram on the east here, just as in the map of Toronto, you can see Pearson Airport. In fact, uh, Greater Toronto is about the same size as Singapore and Singapore's population is 5.5 million, which is uh, roughly similar to that of Greater Toronto as well. I think it's about 6 million and the details of the life expectancy and mortality rates are here, They're, it's quite high. Um, it's quite a diverse uh, population, the majority being Chinese, that's uh, three quarters, as well as uh, sprinkling of other races. And as expected, the main languages spoken are Mandarin and English. And uh, we certainly have, we have four official languages, including Malay and Tamil as well. But we have a lot more unofficial languages like various Chinese dialects, as well as um, Indian languages as well. Okay, let me say a bit about uh, research funding in Singapore, since um, those of you who are professors may be interested in this. Uh, so this is the how research funding developed in Singapore since 1991. Really, it was, wasn't until 1991 that there was formal investment in R&D in the National Science, National Technology Plan of 1991. And by 2010, the target was for the GERD, the General Expenditure in Research and Technology, Research and Development to reach 3% of the GDP, 1% being a public funding at 2% being private. And I would say we are not there yet. It's about 2.3%, 1% it being public and about 2.3% being, about 1.3% being private. And that's quite similar to that of developed countries. You see Germany and UK is 2 point something. China also is 2.1, but it's behind that of Korea, 4.3%. And um, you might be interested to know that in Canada, your R&D expenditure is about 1.7% of your GDP. So it's it's roughly the same as the rest, but I think you could spend a bit more on R&D probably. Your professors will be very happy to hear this. Um, and let me put myself on this time scale. I, the Surface Science Lab was founded by uh, one of my predecessors in 1986. And I joined the department in 1990 almost at the same time as the National Technology Plan started. So when I joined, I had no startup funding. And uh, for those of you who are researchers know that startup funding is very important because it enables the researchers to set up a lab. I inherited one piece of equipment. I had no graduate students. So we had, for the first few years, had, had to do very simple stuff. And it was not until a few years when I got my first um, 
grant and first graduate student that we started doing serious research. And now we have uh, a comfortable amount of research grants as well as I've trained um, some 40 over PhD students during the course of my career. A little bit about NUS, the National University of Singapore started over 100 years ago as a medical college, a Prince Edward, a King Edward's a medical school um, to train doctors for the local um, for the for 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 the local community, and it has evolved to the National University of Singapore. And as far as the research is concerned, it's divided roughly into eight clusters. Clusters, although professors are like professors everywhere in the world, they do their own thing. Clusters are concentrations of research in a particular area where researchers can collaborate, come together to get additional funding through collaborative research proposals. So the main idea is it's supposed to help us more. So you see uh, clusters in aging, Asian studies, biomedical, science, finance, sustainability, maritime materials, smart Asia, and so on. And um, I happen to belong to the cluster known as uh, uh, material science. And because of that, um, uh, my surface science lab as I said, I have access to several centers. This is a picture of equipment in my surface science lab. The equipment that was bought first in 1986 when the lab was founded is still in the lab. It's the vacuum generators ASCA lab. It's a commercial piece of equipment that can do XPS and UPS and and now it can has a monographic emitter on it as well. It's lasted very long and in the meantime, we have had several home-built equipment that have since been decommissioned. And about 20 years ago, we got a low temperature STM from Omicron and we fitted a growth chamber here. And more recently, another STM from Omicron, this time with a non-contact AFM outfit. Uh, so it has a Q plus sensor, a uh, different kind of sensing on its tip. And more recently, we have an MBE chamber, and I'll talk about MBE quite a bit because we use that to grow many of our 2D materials. And um, more recently, uh, ASTAR, an organization in Singapore, donated a Createch LTSTM chamber to us, and we are in the process of upgrading it by purchasing an STM to fit uh, this system with an STM so that we could use this as well. At the top there, you see a picture of me in Northern Italy um, uh, in front of a shoe shop bearing my name. It says AW Lab. Okay. Um, so I talked about research classes. One of the classes we are associated with uh, is the Singapore Synchrotron Light Source. Um, if you don't no, most light sources are very large. I think uh, Canada has one in Saskatchewan. And in Singapore, we have a compact synchrotron uh, built by Oxford Instruments. This compact superconducting synchrotron is on our campus. It was initially built uh, for IBM. Uh, it's, it's called Helios 2. It was built for IBM for X-ray lithography, but because that did not take off, it's now used for science. And the beam line that I built up was a soft X-ray beam line, known as the SINS beam line. It's a soft, it's a surface and interface nanostructure science beam line. It gives off photons uh, of the energy range between 50 and 1,200 electron volts. We can do all sorts of spectroscopy on it, RPS, XPS, UPS, and we can do X-ray absorption on it as well. And I'll talk a bit more on X-ray, XMCD, X-ray magnetic circular dichroism later on when we talk about magnetic 2D materials. The other center we use is the Center for Advanced 2D Materials, mainly because it has a clean room with lots of fabrication facilities, which are too expensive for any single professor to purchase. So we just pay a certain fee to go and use the facilities and it's very useful for graduate students. It has a clean room, um, class 1000 and class 100 so that these devices can be made. So uh, our students use these when necessary. 
Right. Now, coming to my talk proper, <laughs> my talk is in three parts. First, I'll give a in general introduction to 2D materials, and then I'll talk about 2D semiconducting materials, and then I'll talk finally talk about our work on 2D magnetic materials. So let me first talk about, introduce what 2D materials are. I think many of you have heard of graphene already, so you know what a 2D material is. Essentially, a 2D material is a material, it's a layered bulk material which, which is peeled off on the bulk. So you have removed the van der Waals interactions between the layers and you have a single layer. It's just like graphene when it was peeled off by cellotape and you have a single layer of carbon atoms hexagonally bounded that's separated from the bulk and it has its own properties because of the fact that it does not have van der Waals interactions. Um, if you're a surface chemist, you will note that by doing so, by getting a, a 2D material, you would increase the surface area to volume ratio. So this is very good in catalysis because you've increased the surface area of the, the reaction uh, where, where the, the reaction of the catalyst can take place. And finally, you have confinement of electrons in the plane so that obviously um, results in many interesting properties. And one of the, the interesting uh, points is in the band structure. This is the electronic structure of MOS2, the most common uh, moly disulfide uh, TMD or transition metal dichogogenide. And um, it shows that in the bulk, the layered material has an indirect band gap. Indirect means from its uh, con uh, valence to conducting band, the momentum, there has to be momentum given. So you see the, the band gap is that in gray, it's there and you will see a, a, a slanted arrow here. Whereas in the monolayer, the uh, maximum of the valence is directly below the minimum of the conduction band. So you have a direct band gap semiconductor. So you see, um, not only do you have a direct band gap semiconductor, you have a widening of the band gap as well. So perhaps in more physics language, for those of you who are physicists or who are uh, more able to understand it in physics terms, you can say that the effect of dimensional confinement is due to reduced dielectric screening between the electrons and holes in the semiconductors because there's less material now to screen the electric field. Uh, there will be more, there'll be an increase in Coulomb interaction and more strongly bound excitons and then those found in bound materials. And these excitons are confined in a plane that's thinner than the Bohr radius. And because of that, you get a quantum confinement effect. And you know, for quantum mechanics, the moment you get quantum confinement, you have, you have the um, uh, quantization of energy levels and you have changing of the wavelength of light that is absorbed or emitted. So there are many interesting properties of 2D materials. And this field has started since the isolation of uh, graphene some 20 years ago. Um, the field of 2D, uh, TMD stands for transition metal dichogogenides in case some of you are wondering. The field of TMD, 2D TMDs um, came about soon after graphene was, uh, was isolated. Uh, and there are many different TMDs that you could get because you could have a transition metal anywhere from this transition metal series and a calcogen, sulfur, selenide, or tellurium border to it. It has the structure of three atom layers with uh, right in the center, you have the transition metal and at the surfaces, you have the calcogen in a ratio of two is to one uh, as the formula suggests. And the calcogens can arrange themselves in a hexagonal or tetragonal way. And uh, these are different phases. So for example, in many TMDs, the, the uh, 2H uh, hexagonal phase is semiconducting where the 1T uh, tetragonal phase is metallic. And because uh, you can have many of these 2D TMDs, uh, you get many different properties. And in fact, uh, 
uh, there are also many other 2D materials. And because there are so many 2D materials around, you could imagine us plotting a plot. Oh, before that plot, I'll just say that uh, many different kinds of 2D materials cover all sorts of different properties. For example, you have insulators like hexagonal boron nitride over here. And that's one layer of boron nitride. You could have semi-metals like graphene, sil silicine, germanine, uh, stannine. So these are elemental 2D materials. And you have uh, metals and superconductors. So this could be vanadium oxide, titanium sulfide, or various TMDs. You could have semiconductors. The various TMDs are superconducting as well. The 3 6 family the uh, black phosphorus family of materials. Um, but you notice one thing is missing from here is magnetic 2D materials. And it's this is a fairly new field as some of the papers here suggest it's only 2017 that we have been able to isolate them. And uh, there are many exotic properties. You can find superconductivity and topological insulate materials here and uh, many of your professors in your department are working on these areas and they can tell you more about these materials than I can. So I was saying if you plotted, um, uh, you did a plot of the wavelength against the kind of materials you get, you, you can see your range of 2D materials cover the whole spectrum. So you could select uh, this materials that you need to make a particular application device uh, that you require. So it's certainly a very flexible field indeed, and there are many opportunities that exist. Right. Now I come to the second part of my talk. Um, I shall talk on 2D semiconducting materials, and I'll focus just on 2D platinum disilinide. OK. Now why 2D platinum disilinide? A few people have uh, touted it as the, the successor to silicon. Uh, you know that by now silicon has dominated uh, uh, the field of electronics for more than 50 years and all your chips are made from silicon. And that's because silicon is easy to grow and it has a, a good, good size band gap of about 1 EV plotted there and a mobility of its carriers of about 1 or the, of the order of 1,000 or more, okay, right here. And you see, um, we, have, we have not been able to find another material that could succeed silicon, okay, another material with better properties. But now that we have 2D materials, uh, you see these 2D materials plotted, their mobilities and band gap here. The common ones are shown in blue. Now, the, the ones shown in red, they have higher mobilities. In particular, you see platinum disilicide has one of the highest mobilities, about 200 or more of these TMDs. So some people have started doing research on high mobility, air stable 2D platinum disilicide devices uh, in the hope that it would displace silicon in the near future. So that's why, that's the motivation for us working on platinum disilicide. <laughs> so this is our paper, precise layer dependent electronic structure of MBE grown platinum disilicide. This work was done by Chang Lei, a PhD uh, who was then a PhD student in my lab. And you know that the platinum disilicide was grown by MBE in the MBE chamber that I showed. And it's a precise layer dependent electronic structure. One thing interesting about platinum disilicide is that although that it does, does not have a fixed band gap like silicon with a band gap of 1.1, it has a variable band gap depending on the number of layers it has. So in the plot that was shown in the previous page, it was just that at an arbitrary uh, thickness. So, um, because platinum disilicide is, is, is um, touted as potential successor to silicon, lots of people have started working in it. And we have done this particular study using XPS, Raman, and STM. So here you will see the XPS spectra as you put platinum disilicide on it, which shows we indeed have platinum disilicide. And the Raman also confirms it. 
But more interestingly is the STM. Um, it grows layer by layer, not perfectly. One layer does not complete before the next layer. So uh, there's a, a little bit of islanding forming. You can see from a cross section and integer heights uh, indicating different layers being formed. But on the first layer, you can see you can see a regular structure of the platinum disilicide surface. Now, the interesting thing about STM is that you can, if you do STS, if you do scanning tunneling spectroscopy, that means you uh, do an IV curve, you take measure the current as a function of bias voltage, and you take the derivative di over dv, you get the density of states. Okay, density of states uh, represents the electronic structure of the material. So by doing STS, this is di dv over V, you see that the first layer, we have the conduction band here, the valence band here. We have a band gap of about two EV, and then the band gap increases, rapid, decreases rapidly to 1.1 and then uh, 0.6 and so on as the number of layers increase. And we have also done some calculations. These calculations, um, which have also been done by others, this is for monolayer, this is for bilayer. You notice the band gap is decreasing. And you see uh, in this plot uh, that the theoretical DFT calculated band gap and as well as the experimental band gap that we measured are quite similar. So uh, you can see it is possible to change the band gap of this material. So you can make devices with whatever band gap that you want, if you're able to control the thickness of the material. So that's why platinum disilicide is so interesting. <clears throat> so if you could combine platinum disilicide, you could, in an electronic uh, uh, fuel effect transistor, you can imagine it being used in, as, the car as the channel in uh, a transistor. And if you combine different, um, 2D materials together as building blocks, you can make devices in many industries in the electrical, optical, mechanical industries. So this is a uh, chart is trying to show the versatility of uh, making heterostructures of these 2D materials. Now, this is the picture of uh, a cake in Singapore we call Kueh Lapis that is in Malay. It's a layered cake. So this is something uh, that what a uh, semiconducting 2D heterostructure looks like. It's just layers of different 2D materials. So that gives you an idea of what is 2D materials. So next time you eat this, you can think about 2D materials. The next slide shows a semiconducting roadmap. So roadmaps are used by the semiconductor industry to uh, predict the technologies that will be developing in the future for the industry. And many people have already included 2D materials, 2D technology um, on top of conventional CMOS, silicon CMOS technologies as the future technologies. So many people have included it in the roadmaps and research in these areas or integrating 2Ds with silicon has already started. Okay, if you want to find out more about uh, this field on 2D semiconductor materials, I refer you to this book, uh, which I edited uh, with my colleagues, and it rose out of a conference that we organized a few years ago. It says more about 2D semiconductor materials and devices. Okay, the final topic I'm going to talk about in the third part is on 2D magnetic materials. And over here, I will talk mainly about vanadium diselenide, okay, on our work on vanadium diselenide. So uh, this is a review we wrote about Van der Waals materials for 2D uh, spintronics. Uh, you will see that we have summarized the field of 2D magnetism as such. If we combine the field of 2D materials and use the spin of the electrons, we have the field of 2D spintronics. But the key thing about 2D spintronics is you have to have 2D magnetic materials. And to get intrinsic 2D magnetic materials has been a challenge so far. Uh, materials like chromium X3 today, F 
GT, CGT are being used. You can also make the material uh, magnetic through extrinsic means by defect engineering or surface functionalization and so on. And um, there are many opportunities and challenges in this field. And of course, in order to commercialize this field, we, we must be able to grow these materials using specialized growth techniques. We must be able to grow them in a scalable way. We must be able to grow them with such that they have ambient stability, that they have high Curie temperatures. Curie temperature is a temperature uh, below which it be the material becomes magnetic. So the Curie temperature has to be above room temperature. And uh, we need to understand the interface induced magnetic phenomena. Since these are 2D materials, the interface is very important. So we need to understand interface magnetic proximity, spin orbit torque, spin pumping, multiferocity, and so on. So there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And 2D materials have also the potential to be used in flexible electronic devices. So you can uh, imagine 2D materials being stacked. For example, you have graphene TMDs and 2D magnets given in this paper, this review paper, talked about how graphene can is useful because of its long spin diffusion lengths, its direct dispersion, its weak spin orbit coupling, TMDs, its strong spin orbit coupling, valley optical selection, quantum spin hall effect, and 2D magnets for its non-volatile storage, spin filtering, spin injection, and detection. Okay, let me say more about 2D magnetic materials. And I basically uh, refer to this review that was written by Novoselov uh, and his group. So essentially, uh, physics tells us that in a 3D system, we we'll always get a magnetic phase transition at a finite temperature. Whereas in a 1D system, you can only get long range order at t equals zero. And in the 2D system, which is at the border between a 3D and 1D, the existence of magnetic long range order at any finite temperature depends crucially on a parameter known as spin dimensionality N. So in 2D materials, things are less straightforward. And what is this spin dimensionality? So let me show you this. This has dimensionality from the left, one, two and three. From the left, you see the spins are either up or down. So this is known as the icing model and um, it has a dimensionality of one. And for two, you see the spins pointing anywhere along the plane. That's why it's known as the XY model. And for three, the spins are pointing in any direction with equal probability. So it's known as Heisenberg or isotropic model. So um, how do we find out spin dimensionality? <clears throat> the mermin wagner hohenberg theorem states that thermal fluctuations destroy long-range magnetic order at any finite temperature when the spin dimensionality is three. Okay, so this means that if we have an isotropic Heisenberg model like this, you have gapless long wavelength excitons uh, being formed that have a finite density of states and thus they are easily excited and this um, pre uh, has detrimental effects on magnetic order. So it's not possible for such isotropic uh, materials to be magnetic. In the icing model, on the other hand, when uh, n equals one, you can get a phase transition to a magnetically ordered system since there is an isotropy in the system, right? It's up and down only. And it favors a specific spin configuration. And this opens a gap in the spin wave spectrum, which suppresses the effect of thermal fluctuations. And finally, we have, um, we have uh, planar magnets or the XY model, which shows no conventional transition to long range order. Uh, although the susceptibility diverges below a, a certain finite temperature. Uh, Berezinski, uh, Kostelitz and Taulis 
pointed out that this divergence is associated with the onset of topological order. And this is a new field which uh, studies systems like these. Essentially, it says that you can get quasi long range magnetic order in the XY model below what is known as TKT, uh, Cosselis Towler's temperature. Right, so I've given you uh, briefly what the conditions are for obtaining a 2D magnet. Uh, but just to um, uh, summarize, uh, the Merman Wagner theorem says that at any non zero temperature, you can't, you can get long range order, whether it's ferromagnetic or magnetic, you can only get a long range order if there's some isotropy in the system and isotropy in the system. Because in an isotropic system, um, the magnon excitation gap is incapable of resisting thermal agitations that collapse spin ordering. So this figure I've shown you here comes from a review that shows uh, many common uh, uh, 3D bulk layered materials that are magnetic because one would expect you to search for 2D magnetic materials from these 3D bulk layered magnetic materials. And uh, in green, it shows the ferromagnetic, orange, the anti-ferromagnetic materials. And uh, so the key question is whether there can be some small uniaxial magnetic and isotropy to open up this large bank down gap to lift the restrictions imposed by the Merman Wagner theorem so that you can get uh, magnetism. And it turns out that um, in the last five years, many 2D magnets have been found. The first being the chromium triiodide and others like chromium tribromide, CGT, FGT, and chromium trichloride. This is anti ferromagnetic And uh, we'll talk today about the vanadium diselenide uh, material where there's some controversy. Okay, so for transition metals, uh, Hunt's rule says that you, you have these unpaired electrons, so you would expect, or oh, the question is, are they magnetic in the 2D limit? And we are studying vanadium over here. And this particular paper in 2018 was published where they claim to have discovered strong room temperature ferromagnetism in vanadium diselenide uh, layers on van der Waals substrates. You see these squid um, hysteresis loops. Theoretically, um, but I've got to shift this, this bar so that I can see. Directly, the magnetic moment in monolayer vanadium diselenide arising from the vanadium atoms is predicted to be only 0 0.6 uh, magnetons per vanadium ion, which is much smaller than those of 3D ferromagnets such as iron or cobalt, which is about two magnetons per ion. Per, per ion. But this paper reports a huge value of an order of magnitude larger than iron or cobalt. So this inconsistency has cast doubt on the use of bulk magnetic tools in characterizing 2D magnets where its capability of in extracting a weak signal from a large background subset signal can lead to misleading results. So uh, this is uh, similar to the field of dilute magnetic semiconductors because at one time people uh, were, founding, were finding magnetism in semiconductors that have uh, small amounts of dopants in them. And it appears that a lot of magnetism that's measured is due to the background noise, okay, or, or contaminations. So uh, we suspect that this measurement may not, may have been on the something else besides the material. We did this uh, material as well. And in this paper, we published the following year, 
uh, evidence of spin frustration in a vanine disilla monolayer magnet. And this is where I'll introduce XMCD because XMCD is a powerful technique. You see a figure here whereby you have uh, photons incident on a surface. The photons are circularly polarized and, and synchrotron is unique in that you can get circularly polarized uh, X-rays uh, clockwise and anti-clockwise above and below the plane respectively. Then if you took the X-ray absorption spectra of both and you take the difference, you get the X-ray magnetic uh, circular dichroism signal. So if the difference is zero, then there's no ferromagnetism. If it's not, then there is. So in this case, we studied the, the XMC si signal was almost zero, certainly within 0.1%. So we concluded uh, that uh, there was no ferromagnetism in vanine disilinite. These are some images of the XPS uh, charge density waves we took on the surface. Now, these are some magnetic measurements done by our collaborators since we are not a magnetic lab. And um, even using a 3D uh, tool like Squid, they found uh, no magnetic hysteresis with our samples down to 2 Kelvin. Uh, the positive slope uh, in our plane direction uh, reveals a paramagnetic behavior. And the negative slope here is the diamagnetic response, which is largely from the uh, substrate background. And we have overlap between the field cooling and zero field cooling curves, which indicates a lack of long range magnetic order down to two Kelvin and seven Tesla. And we have a broad maximum in the susceptibility characteristic of a low dimensional systems with short range anti magnetic interaction. So we can imagine a, a hexagonal lattice like this where vanadium atoms, uh, one could be spin up and spin down, and the at ion at the center being either up or down. So this is known as a frustrated spin. And hence, we are postulating that the spin in this material is frustrated. This is some RPS data we did showing charge density wave gap over thing. Now, although we have show no magnetism in 2D vanadium disilinite. We showed that we could get these hysteresis loops. This is XMCD. If we have interface hybridization with a ferromagnetic material. So what we did was we illustrated um, uh, this by putting it in direct contact with cobalt, which is a ferromagnetic material. So you see this AFM images of we, of, we put about three monolayers of cobalt and the XMCD of the L edges, you see this is the vanadium and this is the cobalt. And you see the absorptions are in opposite directions, indicating this anti ferromagnetically coupled. And hence, if we do the XMCD uh, um, hysteresis loops, you get these uh, loops in opposite directions. So, Although uh, vanadium diselenite is non-magnetic, it can be easily magnetized. And that was the point of this paper. So we have um, overcome the mermin wagner theorem uh, limitation by creating an anisotropy in the system. Now, uh, another paper I want to talk about is to create an isotropy, can we do that by using defects? So this paper was done by a uh, former PhD student, Rebecca, can reconstruct silicon, uh, selenium diffusion line defects in monolayer VSE2 induced magnetism. So in this case, we need to find a controllable way of creating defects on the surface. And it turns out that our MBE grown vanadium selenide can be made effective by annealing it to higher temperatures we can get linear defects. You can see the effects in these three directions because of the symmetry of the surface. And if you look at the surface carefully using AFM and we can get atomic resolution of the surface, we can build up an atomic model of the surface. And you can see these missing rows are due to missing rows of selenium. And these uh, missing rows have an eight member ring here, which we attribute 
to a shift of half a unit cell of one side of this line. In other words, we create a reconstructed uh, surface with a line defect. So we wanted to do the magnetic measurements of this material and compare them with our control uh, undefective material. So we did XMCD again, and we did MFM as well. XMCD for the clean surface as expected is near zero. For the defective surface, you see the XMCD signal is non-zero, right? You see some background here, certainly higher than here. In the MFM data, you will see that uh, this is the uh, non-defective and the bottom is the defective. You see that um, uh, the MFM signal, you, you see some contrast here and here. And in the this is the phase image. In the phase image, you can see it moving to higher phases, the amplitudes, hence indicating that you have a surface that was magnetic. So the magnetic properties of our reconstruction patterns were investigated by XMCD and MFM, and we also did DFT calculations. And, and we showed that if you use DFT, calculations on a structure that is reconstructed after uh, the line defects are formed, you have an increase in magnetism, which is consistent with our observations. So hence, we provide an explanation uh, for this selenium deficient defects being responsible for frustrated magnetism. And uh, this could be a prototype system for studying fundamental magnetic phenomena within the 1D limit. Okay, so um, what is what do we know about the Vernanian uh, um, dike system? So we focus on systems that are, are grown by MBE. That means they are very clean and perfect at the atomic layer uh, level. And uh, several papers, including that in Nature Nanotechnology, showed that they could get room temperature ferromagnetism. But other papers, uh, like those of us and other people as well, showed, especially using XMCD, that um, the, the surface is non-ferromagnetic. And although they, it lacks ferromagnetism, it can easily be made ferromagnetic by uh, the proximity effects, for example, uh, which showed by using cobalt, or by defects. Okay, so we showed that it's on the verge of magnetism and defects or uh, ferromagnetic impurities can cause a transition to a magnetiz magnetized surface. The last thing I want to mention is that uh, we also studied uh, another material and uh, we studied chromium ditellurite. We studied chromium because it is likely to be magnetic. But this was not a layered material. So it wasn't easy to uh, um, fabricate a monolayer 2D chromium ditellurite. But in any case, we managed to grow it fairly carefully using MBE. And we showed using our XMC sig signal, si uh, at XMC signals, that at the monolayer level, you could get the transition, the Curie temperature above room temperature in the perpendicular direction. So um, XMCD measurements reveal that it is possible to get a room temperature, uh, above room temperature, Curie temperature for uh, certain 2D magnetic materials. And we, uh, uh, in the paper, we suggest that interface effects at, uh, may be one cause for this. Right, in conclusion, um, I, uh, let's ask ourselves a question whether 2D materials are the materials of the future. This is a certainly an important question. You can see that uh, we still need to be able to grow these materials uh, um, uh, perfectly on the surfaces and we uh, be able to combine them in different combinations to form 2D heterostructures to make practical device applications. So you can imagine devices of the future having many 2D materials 
and interface engineering becomes very important. Uh, so we need to understand 2D, 2D interfaces, 2D metal interfaces, 2D dielectric interfaces, and so on. So hence the surface techniques we use are very important in understanding these materials. So um, having said that, I hope I introduced you to the field and I hope uh, I piqued your interest in the field of 2D materials. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.